In the 80s and 90s, Nissan was known for some fun-ass cars. There was the NX2000, 200SX, the Sintra SER, and the 240SX, and those are just a couple of ones that we got in the US. For outright performance though, the best of Nissan's best were the 300ZX powered by the VG engine and the Skyline GTR powered by the RB. These two engines are more similar than you might think, but the RB became a JDM legend, while the VG, not so much. So today, we're gonna figure out why that is. Does the engineering of the RB really justify its significance, or did we all get Gran Turismo into thinking it's better when it's not? B2B today, we're gonna figure it out. Thank you to Dr. Squatch for sponsoring today's video. I don't put much thought into my deodorant. Sure, it leaves me stinky throughout the day, it has me rubbing harsh chemicals and unnatural ingredients into my body, but hey, the big buff shirtless man said it's good for me, and that's good enough. Looks like someone needs another lesson in hygiene. All natural Jerry, you're back. Nolan, your armpits don't deserve good enough. They're sweaty, stinky, sublime kings that deserve the high performance hygiene of Dr. Squash. Mmm, Birchwood Breeze. Your deodorant may claim to be healthy, but let me show you what that really means. Ah! Is this really my armpit? You bet it is. Dry and smelly, no thanks to that old stink stick of yours. But look what happens when you use Dr. Squatch's deodorant. It's high performance hygiene nourishes and freshens with all natural ingredients, keeping your pits healthy with plants, minerals, and the best that mother nature has to offer. Jerry, aluminum! It's okay, Nolan, use this. That's it. Blast those unnatural ingredients right out of your body. Let them know aluminum is for leftovers. Uh, Jerry, what's that? Body odor. Nothing a smooth glide of alpine sage can't handle. Nolan, together. Unlike the generic bar of synthetic chemicals you've been using, Dr. Squatch actually packs high performance power into their deodorant to fight BO. I'm talking about natural deodorizers like charcoal powder and even probiotics to help prevent the growth of odor causing bacteria. You know what, all natural Jerry, you're right. My awesome armpits do deserve the best. Start feeling and smelling your best today by going to drsquatch.com or click the link below. Plus, new customers can save 20% off when you use code DSCDONUT at checkout. Do you smell that? No. Smells like another armpit in distress. Let's glide, oh, Nolan! No, I just fixed that wall! If you didn't know, Nissan's RB and VG engines debuted all the way back in the 80s. And 40 years later, the RB has gained quite a following among enthusiasts. So much so that Nissan restarted production in 2019. Meanwhile, its VG brother faded away like Patrick's ways in the movie Man Makes a Vase. But us here at Donut love the VG. I'm not willing to stand by and watch a once great engine go quietly into the night. We're giving the VG one last shot, a winner take all grudge match against its brother, the RB. It's three rounds comparing their design differences, performance potential, and their influence on the cultural zeitgeist. Yeah, we broke out the dictionary for that word. Look it up. It means <laughs> Round one, fight! The VG and RB were born around the same time and because of that, they have a lot in common. That similarity could make a difference in later rounds, but first, we gotta look at the biggest difference of all, their layout. The RB is an inline six or I6 and the VG is a V6. Is that difference enough to explain the dominance of the RB? Well, let's find out. One of the most obvious advantages of an inline six like the RB is that it's simpler. Because the cylinders are all in a row, you only have one cylinder head containing all the valves, camshafts, and timing gear for all six cylinders. That simplicity makes inline sixes cheaper and easier to work on. Because they're long and strong and narrow, there's a lot of space on the intake and exhaust sides for things like turbos. A V6 on the other hand, like the VG, has 
two cylinder heads, meaning more top end parts like camshafts and a more complicated valve timing system. All that complexity makes a V6 more expensive to build and harder for an amateur mechanic to modify, repair, or maintain. V6s are also wider than I6s, so there's less space for things like turbochargers. And they're a bit more complicated to install because V6s have dose exhaust headers. That's two. But the upside of that two exhaust headers is you get two spinny boys. Oh, it just took my spinny boy shirt off. <laughs> but you're just gonna be a boost creep, a double boost creep. So the RB can land the first blow for being less complicated. And it's not just the top end of an inline six that's simpler and lighter. The bottom is too. That's because inline sixes are naturally balanced while V sixes often require extra mass, such as counterweights to eliminate vibration. Occur because a piston, like any moving object, has inertia. That's resistance to change in speed and direction. But because pistons are reciprocating, they're constantly changing speed and direction. When that happens, all the energy from a piston's momentum has to go somewhere. And if the engine isn't properly balanced, that energy dissipates throughout it, producing Those aren't just uncomfortable for passengers, they can also cause serious damage to their engine. So balance is a crucial part of engine design. And to see how it can be achieved, let's start with a single piston. The unchecked movement of a single piston as it changes direction produces vertical vibration in an engine. So to counteract that, the piston's movement needs to be balanced by another object or mass moving in the opposite direction. In a single cylinder engine, the crank will have counterweight sitting opposite the piston's connecting rod. That way, when the piston is at top dead center and begins moving downward, the counterweight at the bottom of the crank will rotate upwards, balancing the piston's movement and reducing vibration. But there's another way to counteract the vibration caused by a single piston, just by adding another piston. In a two cylinder engine with pistons moving opposite directions, the pistons themselves act as counterweights for each other. So that eliminates the source of imbalance and the vertical vibration it causes. But it introduces another kind of vibration, rocking. I wanna rock, rock, I want to rock. I wanna rock. <laughs> when one piston is being propelled downward by combustion, that piston is traveling with greater force than the one traveling upward. This causes the entire engine to rock back and forth towards whichever cylinder is on its combustion stroke. So can you solve this problem by adding another piston though? Unfortunately, no. No. An inline three does retain the balance of a two cylinder that prevents vertical vibration because the force produced by each piston's movement is counteracted by the movements of the other two pistons. But the rocking occurs whenever there's an unequal force between two halves of an engine. You can probably see where I'm going with this. So during any part of its movement, if you slice an inline three down the middle, you'll find unequal up and down forces between the two halves and that produces rocking. But there is a solution to both vertical and rocking vibration, an inline six. An inline six is like two inline threes placed end to end. So just like an inline three, the force of any one piston is always counteracted by the movement of two other pistons. But the pistons in an inline six like the RB also move as mirrored pairs. And that mirroring eliminates rocking by ensuring equal up and down forces in the two halves of an engine. That balance means the crankshaft on an inline six doesn't need extra mass to counteract vibrations from the pistons, making it simpler lighter and it can spin more easily. Because of their natural balance, inline sixes like the RB run incredibly smooth. A V6 on the other hand is like two inline threes but joined at the crank and that creates a problem. V6s inherit the inline three's balance when it comes to resisting vertical vibration, but they also inherit the inline three's imbalance and tendency towards rocking. That means V6s, they're rarely as smooth as inline sixes and they often need an addition of balance shafts. Those are rotating rods that act as additional counterweights. That adds bulk and complexity and that's why the VG engineers didn't use them. Instead, to minimize the characteristic V6 vibration, they eliminated as many other sources of imbalance as they could. They improved the tolerances and manufacturing engine parts to ensure individual parts themselves were balanced. They used lightweight pistons and connecting rods to minimize the forces those create. They even implemented a system to weigh internal engine parts and match them with complementary parts before engine assembly to ensure that each VG could be as balanced as it possibly could. Be. So if you compare an inline six to a V6 in terms of balance, there's really no contest. The inline six wins. And that's probably still the case between the RB and the VG. 
So second hit, now goes straight to the RB, but it's more of a jab than a haymaker, but so far it's the, in V6 isn't looking good. He's got a little dink, his eyes puffing up. He's got a little puff die. So at this point you might be thinking that, okay, there's simplicity and smoothness. I6s are just clearly better and the RB has this in the bag. Well, hang on now. Inline sixes were incredibly popular for performance cars throughout history because of their advantages, but their shape creates problems that the V has an answer to. Because all the cylinders are in a row, inline sixes, they're narrow, and that makes them easy to work on, but it also makes them long. You know what they say about a long engine, right? Long internal components. The length of the crank and camshafts mean they lack torsional rigidity compared to shorter versions you'd find in an engine like V6s. Torsional rigidity is what prevents a part or even an entire car from flexing or twisting. Lack of torsional rigidity becomes a problem as engine speeds rise up. At higher RPMs, the internal parts of an engine flex more, subjecting them to more strain and greater wear on parts which support them, like for example your crank journal bearings. In the case of camshafts, those are only being driven from one end, and as speeds rise, they can twist, throwing off the timing of the valves furthest from that driven end. That reduces power and efficiency at high RPMs. Inline sixes, they also aren't just long, they're tall, like me, which leads to packaging problems. I hate packaging. To a car manufacturer, packaging just means how everything fits together in a car's design. So one reason inline sixes are hard to package is because tall engines are hard to squeeze into low, sleek sports cars like the Z32 300ZX. Long engines are hard to package too because they take space away from frontal crash structures which are meant to crumple in an impact. A long engine, it won't crumple, it'll just get crammed into the firewall. They're also hard to package in a front wheel drive car, most of which have their engines mounted transfer Firstly, that's rotated 90 degrees relative to the car. So that becomes an issue when an engine is shared across a bunch of different platforms, which was one of the goals for the VG when it was designed. So, third hit goes to VG for versatility. Round two, performance potential, fight. The RB came out pretty strong in round one, but round two is all about performance potential. And that means we gotta get specific. See, the VG and RB are both engine families and they contain dozens of related designs. We can't pit a 130 horsepower single cam RB against a twin turbo monster VG and call it a fair fight. The pinnacle of VG performance is the VG30 DETT and it came in the Z32 300ZX. We covered the Z32 and its VG motor in this episode. If you wanna watch it, click here. The short version, it was a NASA grade high tech engine for its time. It featured multi-port fuel injection, twin turbos, twin intercoolers, and variable valve timing. It had computer controls for ignition timing, exhaust gas recirculation, and even idle speed. All that fancy and expensive hardware was engineered to optimize engine performance throughout a wide rev range. From the factory, that meant you got 300 horsepower and 283 pound-feet of torque. But during its heyday in the 90s, it was common knowledge that the VG could get more power squeezed out of it. You could add 100 horsepower with simple bolt-ons and break 600 horsepower with bigger turbos, intercoolers, injectors, and a revised ECU. Start adding forged internals like pistons and rods and you can get close to 1,000 horsepower before the crank reaches its limit. Which isn't too surprising because in a factory race trim, the VG was making over 950 50 horsepower in the Nissan MPT-90. The VG was, and still is, an amazingly capable engine. And what's even more amazing now is how few people are interested in the VG today. You can buy a VG30 DETT complete with turbos and a manual transmission for just 1500 bucks. A big reason why the VG is so cheap is because everybody wants an RB. Those sell for 10 times as much on eBay and that kind of demand was a big incentive for Nissan to restart production. But because the RB is 10 times more expensive, does it mean it's 10 times more better? Well, let's find out. So the pinnacle of RB performance is the legendary RB26 DETT. They put that in the Skyline GTR in 1989 and continued it into the R33 and R34 GTRs. And like its VG brother, the RB featured all the latest engine technology. You got multi-port fuel injection, you got twin turbos, you got variable valve timing, computer controlled ignition, etc., etc. Got the works, right? But by the end of its original production run, the RB was making 316 horsepower and 289 pound-feet 
Studio Torch, similar figures to the VG. And like the VG, the RB became a tuner darling in the 90s, and similar paths to more power were quickly discovered. 400 horsepower with bolt-ons, 650 horsepower with turbos and fuel injection, 900 or more with beefed up internals. You don't have to be a genius to see that the performance potential of the VG and the RB look pretty similar, at least when it comes to the numbers. So, is this round a tie? No, never. There are no ties in the bike club of Jeremiah. Tying is not allowed. That's the number one rule. Number one rule, no ties. Number two rule, don't talk about ties. Number three rule, never wear a tie. <laughs> but the RB has a few surprise moves up its sleeve. One reason why the RB has remained popular all this time is because it incorporates some serious race car technology. The RB26 DETT uses sodium-filled exhaust valves. Most valves are solid metal, but a valve that's been hollowed out and filled with sodium dissipates heat better than solid valves. That sodium has a low melting point around 98 degrees C and a high boiling point around 883 degrees C. Gravity causes liquid sodium to accumulate at the base of the valve where it's exposed to heat of the combustion and it boils. And that sodium gas then moves to the top of the valve carrying heat with it, which dissipates in the cylinder head, cooling the valve. The sodium condenses as it cools, drops back to the base of the valve, and the cycle repeats. Cooler valves can withstand more heat and pressure, meaning the engine can safely make more power. The RB also features individual throttle bodies, or ITBs. Almost every road car uses a single throttle body mounted to one end of the intake manifold. The manifold consists of a main chamber called a plenum that splits off into runners that route air to each cylinder. When you press on the accelerator, the butterfly valve and the throttle body opens, letting in the air the engine needs for combustion. But there's a delay between opening that valve and air actually making it into the cylinders because it's got to travel through the rest of the intake manifold. A car with individual throttle bodies has one throttle body for each of its cylinders attached directly to the head. That means when the butterfly valve opens, air is nearly instantaneously delivered into the cylinders for improved throttle response. Features that improve the way an engine gulps down air or dissipates heat should increase tunability. And tunability is an area where the RB's reputation seems to beat out the VG, in spite of their similar potential power figures. As an inline six, the RB is simpler and easier for tuners to work on, so that's definitely a factor. But the power figures from upgraded RBs and VGs are so similar, and the VGs may be harder to work on, but it costs a 10th of the RB. So I think round two is a tie. Rule number four, we can have ties. You just can't wear one. Round three, fight. Being cheap seemed to save the VG in round two, but that cheapness might be its undoing in the final round. Now the winner of round three is the engine that has embedded itself in our psyche and our hearts, and it's gotta be the RB. The VG will probably never attain legendary status like the RB simply because of the cars they came in. The Z32 300ZX has been criticized for being too complicated, having too many computer controls, and not enough space under the hood. The Skyline GTR does have more space for things like big turbos and intercoolers, but it was still incredibly complicated with its ITBs, twin turbo complexity, advanced limited slip differentials, all-wheel drive system, and four-wheel steering. But nobody cares about that because it's a Skyline GTR. It was the star of Gran Turismo, the Fast and the Furious, and a million computer desktops and racetracks around the world. In spite of its complexity, or maybe because of all that technology, the Skyline ended up with a racing pedigree that the Z32 never matched. The GTR was hugely successful in Japanese and Australian touring car racing, earning it the Godzilla nickname from the Australian press. The GTR's success at the track was often attributed to its RB engine, and that reputation for performance led to the RB being used for the Australian market Holden VL Commodore one of the few non-Skylines to ever receive the RB. That race pedigree combined with exclusivity helps explain the RB's continued popularity. The VG was produced by the millions and fit it into everything from Maximas to minivans. It can be found in every junkyard across the US and that's one reason why 
it's so cheap. The RB was never available here. Its US reputation grew alongside American enthusiasts' increasing interest in JDM cars, which we were exposed to as a result of video games and the rise of the internet. The combination of exclusivity and international reputation has a ton to do with why the RB remains such a big deal today. It's why it wins the round and the fight. I was really pulling for VG. I did not make a bet against you. It's been years, but the comment still haunts me. More hearse purrs? Was it even possible? How much horse is too much horse? I had to know. Test after test, Hello? failure after Eli. failure. I began to doubt that I'd ever find out. Then, it happened. I think I have it! I think I have it! I've done it. I've done it. Hearse purrs are infinite. So saddle up boys and girls and hit the trails with this 100% scientifically accurate new Hearse Purrs shirt, available right now at DonutMedia.com. And it features everything that you need to know about pure equine muscle. Now a real horse, that'll cost you thousands of dollars. But this pony is $29.98, which is way less than $30. Go ask your mathematician uncle. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of B2B. If you want to see more content, uh, some behind the scenes stuff, click that join button. Send you to the Donut Underground. You get a lot of cool stuff. You get to talk to me on the Discord. You get cool stickers. And you get to see mainly stuff we can't put on the main channel. That's, that's the big draw there. It's a lot of fun stuff. Follow us on Instagram at Donut Media. Follow me on Instagram at Jeremiah Burton. Follow me uh, at TikTok at Silence of the Lambda. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until next week. Bye for now.